looks like it's already recording actually. Okay, so with that said, I think we are going to get started. Uh, thank you everybody for joining us today. Uh, welcome to the AICPA's How a CPA Exam Question is Created webcast. I'm Lauren Walter, I'm your moderator for today. I'm a communications manager with the AICPA exams team based out of the AICPA's New Jersey office. And in today's presentation, we will be giving you a behind the scenes look at how an exam question, specifically a multiple choice question or MCQ is created from start to finish. Just also, so uh, wanna be upfront, we will not be covering simulations or written communications, uh, though we are looking to have a webcast focused around these topics in the near future. Now, before we get started, uh, next slide. Thank you, Renee. Uh, before we get started, just a few housekeeping items to go over. First, as I noted before, today's presentation will be recorded and you'll receive a link to access it within 24 hours. Also within the email that you get after today's presentation will be links to various resources that we'll be discussing today. So don't worry if you miss any website links. Second, we encourage active discussion throughout. So please feel free to submit your questions to us using the Q&A box at the bottom of the Zoom menu. Our wonderful AICPA exams content team members and CPAs, Liz, Kevin, and Kathy are on hand, ready to monitor and respond to your questions. Um, and you can upload others' questions as well if you like them or wanna hear them answered by clicking on the thumbs up icon. I'll also be monitoring this throughout and may pass some of your questions along to our presenters as we pause throughout to take questions. Regarding the chat box that many of you have been uh, using so far to say hello in, please only use the chat box at this point to report any technical issues that you may be encountering. Otherwise, we will not really be monitoring the chat box. So just use the Q&A box. Now to keep things a little bit more interactive today, we'll be launching a couple of poll questions to you throughout the presentation. So we encourage you to keep an eye out for those and respond when prompted. And a note, do not submit your poll question response in the Q&A or chat box. You can respond directly in the separate poll question pop-up window uh, when you're prompted. Finally, at the conclusion of today's uh, webcast, you'll be prompted to take a really quick survey, just five questions. This is to let us know what you thought of today's presentation. Your feedback is very important to us and helps shape the format and content discussed in future presentations. So please take a minute or two to fill it out. We'd really appreciate it. Now to quickly summarize for anybody who's just joining us, Yes, you'll get a recording of today's presentation. Yes, we'll send you links to resources discussed. Submit your questions in the Q&A box. Keep an eye out for poll questions and please take the brief survey at the end of today's presentation. Now, with that said, uh, let's move on and introduce you to our presenters for today. We have Carrie Chester and Renee Varias, uh, who each give a little information about themselves. Renee and Carrie. Sure. Hi everybody, I'm Carrie Chester. I've been on the exams team at the association for 16 and a half years. I have two main parts of my job. Uh, the first part is what I'll be talking about today, which is external item development. And the other part is I'm a co-lead for all ADA accommodations for exam candidates. Uh, welcome and we're so happy that you're here. Hi, I'm Renee Varius. I'm a senior manager of test development at the ASCPA. I have uh, 26 years of experience in high stakes certification and licensure exams. I've been with the ASCPA for 13 years. Um, one of my main jobs actually is monitoring the inventory of items of test questions in our bank and making sure that we have enough in the pipeline and enough to supply the exam going forward. And when there are changes to the exam, making sure that we have the questions in place before a new exam launches. Cool, thank you guys. And Renee, I'm sorry, I messed your name up and we even went over <laughs> before this. So yeah, okay. Anyways, here's what we will be covering today. Uh, first, we're just gonna give you a brief overview of an MCQ and kind of the structure of it. Then finding the gaps in terms of how we, how we figure out what content needs to go on the exam. Uh, then we'll talk about writing, revising and reviewing, uh, the whole process with that. Um, there's a big external process. Then we'll get to the internal review process that our AICPA exams team cover. Then we'll talk about pretest items, which I know is a very popular topic for candidates. And finally, we'll talk about um, you know when it's time for an exam question to say goodbye to the exam, and you know what constitutes it being ready for retirement. Okay. And now, before we get started, we're just going to ask you a quick poll question. I'm pulling that up right now. Which best describes you? And we'll share the results with you guys as well, so you can see who else is tuned in today. Give you guys another few seconds to fill it out. All right, 
looks like most of the responses have come in. So I'm gonna go ahead and end the polling and share the results with you. So it looks like most of you are candidates. Um, we have some students on the line, which is great that you're getting started early. Some of our exam writers are here. Uh, so shout out to them, some review courses, academics, um, and other, whatever that constitutes. Uh, welcome everybody though, glad you're here. Okay, and with that said, I think we are ready to move on to our uh, first part of the presentation. Okay, thank you, go ahead, Renee. So I have the easiest one. I'm just gonna walk you through all the parts of a multiple choice question. I'm gonna introduce a little jargon that we use so that you can follow through uh, the rest of the presentation. So on the screen, you have a sample MCQ. MCQ is multiple choice question. All the time, I always say it's an item. So when I go through my uh, slides in the future, I'm gonna be saying item, item assignment, item writer. It just means MCQ. You see at the top, the item stem. We don't call it a question all the time. Sometimes we do, but we don't all the time because as you see, this is a complete the sentence. So it's not actually a full statement with a question mark. You see the four options, you have a key or the correct answer, and you have three distractors or incorrect answers. Renee, Dana. <laughs> all right, guys, distractors, they are not there to trick you. Let me say it again. They're not there to trick you. <sighs> I get it. I understand the frustration. So let me try to uh, assuage some of your uh, concerns. Test development is baked in to all the item development process. What is test development? I didn't know till I started here. So let me share with you what that is. We are a subgroup of the exams team. I'm on the test development team as is Renee, as is many others. And our entire job is the actual words, okay? We look at every question. Is, it, is there any logic issues? Uh, are we adhering to the style guide? You know, italicizing authoritative literature references. Are we bolding negative terms like not and no? Is it fair, right? Is it concise? All of that is looked at at every step of the process. I will show that in later slides when I go through the review process. But just know that trickery is not at the top of the list. It's not even on the list. We do everything to avoid tricking you. Um, but I get it. Now, maybe I'm the only one here, but I'm a very nervous test taker. And uh, the irony is not lost on me that I work in testing. So there's like one of us on the inside. So here's what happens with me. And I'm hoping that I give this example a little advice and it helps any one of you, hopefully all of you, but anyone I'll take. So I sit down at the computer, I look at the question, and I rationalize why every single option could be right. I mean, down to the minuscule, okay, D could be right if they meant this, but didn't say it. Or this could be right if what this means is that it's the what if, what if, what if. And then you're in that tailspin. I don't know about you, but palms are sweating, hearts racing, almost like public speaking, and you're lost. Let me give you advice. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. The stem, the prompt, the question has everything you need in it to respond and choose A, B, C, or D. If it's not there, it's not supposed to be there. If it is there, it has been looked at and looked at and looked at again to make sure everything you need is there and nothing that you need is not there. It is as important what we're asking you as it is how we ask you the question. It's hand in hand. So I'm hopeful, now you're convinced, right? I'm very believable and very honest person. I'm hoping you're convinced, but when we go through the process of the internal and external review, I'm really hopeful that, um, that you understand where we're coming from. Renee, I don't know if you have anything you wanna add or you can just move on. Yeah, actually I had a, a, a kind of a funny um, experience a few months ago, my son who is a, a junior just finished his junior year in high school and he was taking some practice SAT and ACT classes and so we had a half hour with a prep course uh, provider. And the first thing he said is you know when they write these tests they try to trick you and I said you don't know who you're talking to. I said I'm in test development for 26 years, we don't want to tr to trick you. The whole point of the exam is to find out what you know and if we trick you, we're not gonna get that information that we need from you. You know, it, if we lead you down a path that will 
ultimately make you choose the wrong answer because we tricked you, then we don't know anything about you. So um, we, we, as Carrie said, we write the questions as clearly as possible. We have candidates all over the world and we wanna make sure that the language is accessible to everyone. Um, so we try not to use any regional um, wordings or anything like that, but um, believe us when we say, we don't wanna trick you. We wanna know who knows the subject matter and who doesn't. And the questions may seem like the, the, the options might seem really specific and slight differences, but that is only so that we can identify who knows the, the subject matter and who doesn't know the subject matter. So moving on to finding the gaps. I have, uh, we have these, uh, the blueprints on our website. Um, they will give you really important information about content organization and, and waiting skill allocation and weighting, representative tasks, and references. Um, first, we use the exam blueprints to identify topics to develop into new items. And whenever we have a change to the blueprint, like a new blueprint is going live tomorrow um, that, that uh, was published uh, about a, a, maybe a year ago, last uh, fall. Actually, Renee, sorry, just to add in, the, yeah. the, new, the updated exam launches tomorrow. Um, the blueprints that you can see on the screen that are effective as of tomorrow have been live for about six, seven months now. We always um, publish the updated blueprint at least six months before the new content is reflected on the updated exam. Right, right. So those those updates are will be seen in the exam starting tomorrow. Um, so the blueprints are broken down by section and they show you the content organization and waiting and all this um, very important information. If it's not in the blueprint, it's not going to be on the exam. So it's very important that you refer to the blueprint when you are studying. Um, let's move on to the next slide. This is uh, an example of the auditing and attestation blueprint. So it will give you um, percentage weight ranges for the different content areas and the different skill uh, allocations. So you can see it's got a range for area one, ethics, professional responsibilities, and general principles, 15 to 25%. Um, after we assemble the exams, we have an exercise where we go through and we confirm that every single exam form uh, adheres to these weight ranges um, so that we know that the uh, exam forms are all equal. Um, Moving on, we have an example page from the FAR blueprint. Now the blueprint will show you up, to, up top it, what area it is. It's area one, the range is 25 to 35%. So we call them area group topic. It's section area group topic is how we uh, whittle down to the, the smallest bit of, of uh, um, coding in our, exam, in our item bank. Um, the group is conceptual framework here, and then there's two topics in here. This tells you that conceptual framework will be tested at the remembering and understanding skill level. Standard setting process will be tested at remembering and understanding. If we go down to the bottom of the page here, we see um, balance sheet and statement of financial position will be tested at application and at analysis. And we have over here representative tasks. So this would be a representative task for um, work that would be done where we will test it at the application level. And, and down here, detect, investigate, and correct discrepancies. That's really more of an analysis level. And if something is uh, written to the analysis level or evaluation for the auditing section, um, that's pretty much guaranteed it'll be at a simulation um, type of exam question and the application and remembering understanding application is kind of split between the two. You might get TBS, you might get simulations, you might get multiple choice. Remembering understanding is all multiple choice. Um, so moving on to- Just a quick note about the oh. blueprints. Um, sorry for, for anybody who's, okay. you know, this is their first introduction to the blueprints. Um, there's a ton of resources out there about what the blueprints are and how to use them as sort of your your go-to um, you know, guide for preparation. So we'll be sharing links to that after today's presentation. And I don't know if I mentioned this, but these are called representative tasks because it in no way uh, describes every activity that's done by a CPA, but 
they are representative of the types of tasks. So writing, revising, and reviewing. Carrie? Yeah, thank you. All right, this, this slide is my favorite slide because all little cartoon people, but there's a lot of information in here. So trying to get distracted by how precious it is. <laughs> so uh, first and foremost, top left, you see the map of the United States and six huge desks in a teeny tiny factory. That represents our office is in Ewing, New Jersey, which is that little factory in the top right, although our office is right now home. Um, and the desks represent my network of writers and reviewers. And some of them are on now. So I just want to say hello, and I miss you. And thank you for all the work you do for us. It's just so appreciated. So a little shout out. Um, oh, and a quick plug after this, I know there were some people who had asked how to get involved. We'll make sure you get information so you can get in contact with me and we can talk through uh, if you'd like to join the network. So let me first tell you what you do before you join. So you have to be a CPA or a JD, so a JD for tax law and regulation. And then we go to the top right, you see the little content expert and the mentor. So the content expert is the item writer. The mentor, they actually have two. They have a staff CPA. In fact, Kevin, Liz, and Kathy, who are manning the chat, or the Q&A rather, um, are mentors for auditing attestation and uh, business environment and concepts. Um, and they also have a test development mentor. So let me explain. The writer will get a batch of questions they have to write based on their expertise and their comfort level. And they submit questions to the CPA mentor. And it's an iterative process. So they go round and round. Here's what I submit. Sometimes they're like, great, move it on. Sometimes they go back and forth with just cleaning it up. Um, the staff CPA mentor will check to make sure the skill levels, right? The blue, you know, to the blueprint, to the topic. Um, there's one right answer and three plausible but incorrect answers. But with a reference team, they'll do all of that. Okay, once the writer and the staff CPA are like, these are great, they move it on to the test development staff um, um, mentor. Hello, mentor. Um, and you can probably guess why. They're checking logic. Are we being concise? This style guide, is it fair? Does it make sense? You know, or, you know is it, is, does the flow of words make sense and that we, we're asking the right way? It is just the grammar, the wording, and the structure. Okay, so now this, these items have been looked at by an external SME writer, written in, and then a staff CPA and a staff test development uh, specialist. Only then will they move on to right below the three little cartoon people. I love this slide, I can't. Um, the three people below it um, who are um, external item reviewers. They're fresh eyes, they have not been involved. And they're going to look at an entire section item that were created. If five writers wrote 10 questions each, they're gonna be looking at all 50 in that section. They look at it independently of one another. So they go into the system, they look at the items, they say, this looks good, accept it. This could be cleaned up a little bit. Let's work on, you know, this is what I think we should do, change some language, um, or you know what, there's some fatal flaws, we should just reject it, it shouldn't move on. After they've looked at them all independently, they all come together. Recently, it's been two-dimensionally on Zoom, but you know, we go and we get together in a room and have a conversation about all the items that haven't been accepted without any question. You know, these are the ones that have some meat to them, want to have a conversation about it. And on the bottom left, you see a little test developer with the thumb up. They facilitate the conversation. Do you want to know why? You probably already know it. You can probably say it with me if you weren't muted. Um, they make sure any changes to content that happen don't introduce issues with style, logic, fairness, or being concise as there appeared at the end of each sentence. I mean, everything other than is the question right. Okay, so now just to recap, we had a test developer and a staff CPA review the question. Then we had three external SME reviewers review it while a test development specialist is facilitating the conversation. Six people have been involved, not including the writer. Next. <laughs> yeah, no, and I wanted to throw in there that what's really great is when the, the, on the bottom right of the screen, these three reviewers review it on their own. They don't get to see anybody's comments. They don't get to see any of the back and forth that happened with the question. They're looking at it the way a candidate would. Um, and, and giving their honest opinion, they write 
really thorough notes about, I think this question could be fixed by doing this, that, and the other thing. And then once we have comments from all of them, we get together with, with someone like me, a test developer, to go through all the comments. And if one person has a problem with the question, it does not move forward. All three have to agree that the question is good and it's worth a spot on the exam. Great point, thank you. So now we say thank you, we pay the writers for the accepted item, we pay the reviewers, we pay the reviewers for their time, and now we own the question. Now they're ours. This starts the internal review process. Each check mark is another person looking at it. The internal subject matter expert, the CPA in the middle, it's not the exact order, but the middle one in the check marks, they're looking at it to make sure there's one correct answer, three plausible distractors, or three plausible incorrect answers. The referencing is right. The skill level is appropriate for the topic that they've, that they've written the item to everything. So they look at all of this for the content specific stuff. I mean, they look at the grammar as well. Because, you know, they, they, they know what they're doing, but their main charge here is to make sure that content is correct. Format, test developer, editor, fairness. That's all our shop. That's all test development. Looking for the same things again, style, format. The bottom check mark fairness, everyone's kind of looking for fairness. If if a table is presented in one way in an MCQ, in an item, and then a candidate goes to the next item and the table looks completely differently, that's not fair. That's distracting. You should totally anticipate the structure over and over, lather, rinse, repeat. It should be exactly the same as what you've prepared yourself for. So if the wording is different, if we don't bold the negative terms, that's gonna stick out to you. That's not fair. That's distracting. That's not fair. Um, I have two examples for sensitivity because sensitivity and fairness is kind of the, the bottom check mark. And I do those reviews. So of course I think they're the most important. Um, so two examples, one is silly. We'll never say Jack and Jill own company A because in your head, if you're not doing it now, Jack and Jill went up the hill, right? That, that's silly, that's kitschy. This exam needs to be for lack of a better term, as boring as possible. It is content. We don't want anything around it that would distract you, make you think of something else or take you out of your testing experience. Back to that anxiety part, right? We don't need you to get flustered. We need you to focus. So the other one is with trust and estate. If someone inherits money, right? We don't have to say who passed or why they passed or whatever situation got them. You can just say, there's a trust, right? Um, because inevitably there's gonna be someone who knows someone who passed that way or someone that they know who they loved or it's in the news or there's some tragedy. There's just so many reasons that that would take you completely out. And then once you're out, it is so hard to get back in. The, the focus for four hours in a clip to then lose focus over something emotional um, you know, this is a timed exam. Well, you all know it's a timed exam. We don't want to waste your time and we don't want to take time from you to get back into the zone. So we really make sure that that doesn't happen. So where I said before with external, there were six people, there are five more reviews. Only then, and to Renee's point, just like the external review, everyone has to agree. If one person says, oh, I don't like this, we have to change it. All the other approvals get knocked off, start over. It's not like, oh, make this change and it moves forward. It's like, oh, make this change. Everybody has to look at it again and make sure they're okay with it. So now it's 11 different reviews, if my math is right, um, before the item is even ready to be selected as a pretest question. So I just covered a lot, but I'm hopeful this also to bring back to distractors are not there to trick you. I, I, I hope that there's a little more confidence um, in the rigor of our process to try our best to ensure that doesn't happen. That's all I got. <laughs> and I wanted to add some, um, some people ask why we have people who are not CPAs reviewing these test questions as well. I mean, you know, one of the test developers and he looks at every single question is a PhD in linguistics. And so we know that he's looking at them as, as they say with a fine tooth comb. But um, one of the things that non-CPAs 
non-subject matter experts can pick up on is if there's if there seems to be a leap in logic where a CPA might say, well, I know that they meant that. But in the question, we'd say, but but you're not saying that. So I think you need to add that little bit of information. There might be assumptions that subject matter experts would make that as test developers who are not CPAs, we can point those things out and say, you know, you might want to add something. Or sometimes I'll look at a question and say, even I know the answer to that question. I didn't do well in my one semester of accounting. So maybe the question is, is too easy. So moving on to questions. Yes, okay, so that's a lot of information. Um, I hope you guys are finding it helpful uh, to understand our behind the scenes process. So we've gotten a ton of great questions, both live during the presentation that you guys are submitting in the Q&A, as well as questions that you submitted in advance. So we're going to take a look at a couple of those. So first question, um, how are candidate entry, how do I, how is candidate entry level knowledge for questions determined? Uh, we do um, a practice analysis and uh, through that they ask questions of the people who are, you know, in focus groups and surveys and all that, what level of, um, for each topic should this be a question in this topic be included in the exam? First of all, is it worthy of, of space in the exam? To what extent should it be um, included? And what the skill level should be? Like if it should just be at, a question should be asked on, uh, you know, certain investment categories at a remembering and understanding level, you know, that's more of a a basic level. But if it's something that's more advanced, like how to do an audit, we'd want to ask more complex questions because that is something as an entry level CPA, you need to have very solid knowledge of how to do that activity. So it, it a lot of it comes from the survey and from conversations. We send out the, uh, the blueprints for uh, public exposure and comments, and we take all that information and, and turn that into the blueprints. At it. Now, despite, um, you know, so many pairs of eyes reviewing a question before it makes it onto the exam, if a candidate does see a, an MCQ and think, you know what, I think there's an error in this question, how would they go about reporting that? There are a couple ways to do that. Um, one, at the end of the exam, there's a survey and there's an open-ended response and the candidates do write in um, saying, oh, I think there's a typo here, or, uh, you know, you have, uh, I think two of the options are exactly the same. Sometimes our brains, when we're reading, we, we chunk what we see. So we don't read every single letter. And, uh, you know, there's one question where it, one option says the maximum of such and such, and the next one says the minimum of such and such. And we get a lot of candidates saying, you have two options that are exactly the same. And they're not, it's just the way they're reading them. But sometimes errors do get through. That's one of the reasons why we pretest questions to, to test them out and make sure that there are no issues with them. But if you do see something that you think is incorrect, put it in the comments of the survey and give us detail. If you just say, I think there are lots of errors in the exam, we really can't act on that. But our 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 test developer who does the, who's the, the PhD in linguistics, he also looks at all the candidate comments and he takes that information to heart. And he says, you know what, maybe we can be clearer in, in our wording. And so he will take that information going forward and try to make the exam better. But if we have very specific detailed description of what the errors are, um, we can see which questions you got on the exam and we can narrow it down and try to figure out which question it is that you're talking about. But the more information you have, the, be the better. Like the third question that I got in the second testlet had an error. That's perfect because we can easily track down that question. And Renee, when, when you mentioned survey, uh, all candidates will take a survey at the end of each section that they take at the Prometric Test Center? That's correct, yes. Okay. Yes, and if you don't put it in the survey, you can always send us an email. The the, I think you you get a uh, a printout at the end of the exam and has information about our you know how to contact us. But we do like getting that info. We don't like finding out that we did something wrong, but we want to get that information. Of course, 
Um, okay, I'll ask one more question before we move on. Um, how frequently are exam questions you know, created and updated by the AICPA? Oh, my, that's easy. I can answer this one. No, so they're, they're done quarterly. So we do four item writing drives a year and they're happening every quarter. So if you know, we get an item order in January, it's safe to assume that those items could show up on the exam in July. Is that right, Renee? That's right, right? Okay. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> All of a sudden I doubted myself. I doubted, that's right, July. <laughs> yeah, we used to have a much longer runway to get items on the exam. It's like a year and a half. And yeah. then we went through some, some uh, exercises a few years ago to speed up our, our process. And this is the fastest that it's ever been. Um, the, going fully remote actually helped with that um, because we don't have to get hotel reservations and meet in person and flights and all that stuff. But um, I think we can maintain this once we go back to in-person meetings as well. We do miss some of our in-person meetings. Um, you, okay, with that, that <laughs> <laughs> with that said, we're gonna move on. And just to note, if there's time at the end, we're gonna try to answer as many questions as we can, um, you know, but we wanna be aware of your time as well. All right, and this is, I think, is our final poll question gonna launch now. Uh, true or false, pretest items count towards a candidate's score. I don't wanna give any major spoilers, but it looks like most of you know the answer to this one. All right, I'm gonna end polling in a second. Looks like a good percentage of you have responded. Give you another few seconds. Okay, true or false, pretest items count towards a candidate score. Looks like 90% of you got that one right. And for those who did not, hopefully this is a, a, a pleasant surprise to hear about. And now we'll be talking about uh, pretest items, which I know is a very big uh, uh, topic for candidates. You're muted, Renee. I knew that was going to happen at some point. Um, so before we put questions on the exam that count towards your score, we want to try them out. Um, it's possible to ask a very simple uh, concept in a very complicated and difficult way. It's also easy to ask questions about a very complicated concept in a very simple way where everyone could know the answer. So even though someone might say, oh, this is really hard, we wanna find out from the actual candidates how, uh, how hard the question actually is. Um, every candidate will get pretest questions. Um, this is the step after an item gets all of the approvals, it gets added to the exam. We have a certain number of multiple choice and simulation pretest and, and essay pretest questions in the uh, given in each uh, candidate's exam. Um, and all we want to do is collect data on them. Uh, we wanna use that information to assess the quality of the question, the difficulty level and scoring information so that when we assemble them into an exam later, uh, we can make all of the exam forms of equal difficulty because we know we have this, this uh, evidence from the, uh, the pretesting. Uh, they're not part of your score calculation and you will have no indication when you're taking the test of which ones are pretest questions. Um, like I said, we think we know how questions will perform, but sometimes we're surprised. It could be that uh, high performing candidates like candidates who get most of the questions on the test right are getting some of these pretest questions wrong. And we can, we can see that by the statistics and we can say, you know, the high performing candidates are getting, are answering this other option, not the, not the key. And maybe we have two keys. Maybe we, we missed something and there is a, a, a second key in that in that question. In that case, the question would not move forward. It would go backwards. It would get reworked or thrown out. Um, hopefully we could rework it, put in a new option, pretest it again. Anytime we make a question, a change to a question, like if a standard changes and we have to change in terminology, we bring that question back around and we pretest it again, just to make sure that we haven't made any uh, any errors in, in making that adjustment to the question. So it's, uh, it's a, a very important step. And it's also very important that 
you don't you all don't know which questions are pretest so that we can get an accurate reading on each one of these questions. Um, once we get the the information back the data of how candidates did on the questions our skilled measurement experts and we've got this this woman here with the <laughs> Carrie's favorite person. Um, the test developer content people and psychometricians who are the people who calculate and and are there are measurement experts. Um, will look at these questions and say yeah this is something that we could use um, or it's it's problematic and we just can't include this in the exam and then once that process is done we bring those questions to a standing committee of subject matter experts and they're the final decision makers of whether a question moves forward to be operational or not and sometimes the question will have good stats and they will look at the question and say we still don't like it and it will get retired so did you know there are 12 multiple choice pretest questions and one test based simulation pretest item for each section and bec there is also a an essay a pretest essay question in everyone's exam the next step is retiring questions we will periodically look at questions. If new standards come along, uh, the CPAs on staff will look at all the questions that could be affected by the new standard and uh, to see if there's any obsolescence, any reason to retire or rework a question so that it could, um, if, it's, if it doesn't belong in the exam anymore because the standards have changed, we might have to retire the question. But if there's a little tweak we can make like terminology, that changes, then we could rework that question and bring it around as a pretest question. We also do forensic monitoring on questions. Um, there are some questions that over time become easier or harder. It could be that I always use the example that IRAs were new at one point. So the questions that we would ask about an, you know, an IRA would be difficult at the beginning, but over time they'd get easier and easier. So we may look at a question and say, you know, this one's getting easier. It could be that. Um, maybe it's just such common knowledge that we shouldn't be asking these questions about it. Or if a question gets much harder, it could be that it's a something that just isn't done anymore and maybe the question doesn't belong in the exam. One of the things about included in obsolescence is also stale. A couple of years ago, we retired a whole bunch of questions in BEC because they referred to backing up your computer on diskettes. And we realized that that's really not uh, modern anymore. So we got rid of those questions. They weren't wrong. They were just so outdated. Um, every year we also release questions to review course providers. So those are the disclosed items. We would remove those from the exam as well. And uh, we up periodically update our sample test that's on our website and the questions that are used on the sample test would be removed from the bank as well. And uh, just a quick note on the sample test, if you have not checked it out yet, uh, you can find it on our website, it's free. So it's it, it doesn't include the same number, it does not, let me clarify, it does not include the same number of questions that you'll find on the actual exam in a Prometric Test Center. It's, it's more there to help familiarize you with the look and feel and functionality of what to expect and how the questions are, you know, kind of pulled together. Uh, so that can be found right on our website. There's one for each um, of the four sections, and we'll be linking you to that as well uh, in the follow-up email. And it looks like, okay, we've reached the end. We've got a little bit of time. So we're going to take some questions now. Uh, we've had some really good ones coming in. So first one, does the skill level correlate to the level of difficulty and the value of the question? The value of the questions are all the same. All of the multiple choice questions, regardless of their uh, skill level, are, are count as one point or one, they're all equal. Um, Task-based simulations would be di different because it depends on how many measurement opportunities there are. Um, if something is basically asking eight questions in one task-based simulation versus um, five questions in a task-based simulation, those would be weighted differently. Um, what was the first part of that question about the does the skill level correlate to the level of difficulty yeah not necessarily and 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 i could argue that the the level of difficulty would be different for each person 
uh, one person could be more comfortable in tax than someone else or audit or IT. So the, the level of difficulty is personal. Um, the, you could also argue that a remembering and understanding question might be a little harder to answer because it gets at a very specific bit of knowledge where actually putting it to use in an application question, you might say, oh, well, I actually know how to, how to do this process so I can answer this question because I've done the process, but I might not know the specific definition of, of something that you would find in a, in a remembering and understanding question. Also, um, um, mm -hmm. it could be, hold on, it also could be the way the question is written. There could be a remember understanding question, are you question, but if it's written and we get this with the stat, if it's written in a way that it's proven to be more difficult, the difficulty level may be high, higher, but the skill level would remain the same. So although it seems a little confusing, it, it, it really, the skill level and the difficulty level really don't correlate. Right. Um, and just to add, if you have any more questions about how, you know, item difficulty determination is made or, you know, a little bit more related to scoring and all that, we did do a webcast specifically all about that. And you can also find all that information in, in great detail right on our website, which we will link you to. Okay. Um, getting to the next question. Any way to find out the answers if you pass? What I mean is I'm curious which ones I got right or wrong. Unfortunately, we don't release our test questions because if we did, we couldn't use them again. So um, that is not possible. But you do get a, a score report, right? Only if you fail, I believe. Mm, I believe so. I, I'm, I'm not as familiar with that, the back end of um, the testing process. I, I believe you do That's get true. a score report if you fail um, that might highlight areas that you did weaker in or stronger in. And I think mm -hmm. it, 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 it might vary by jurisdictions. So you might want to look into this. We do have some more information on our website about how the score report works, uh, but you can get a little bit of guidance on your performance, but getting that specific, I don't think we, we share because like Renee That's said, you have to yeah. delete the questions. Okay. Um, somebody wants to know the format and weight of each part of the exam, which I think you can just find right in the blueprint. Right guys. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Um, how recent, somebody wants to know how recent changes will impact specifically BEC, uh, the BEC section MCQs. And that might be more of a content question. Recent changes as in? I assume that the, 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 blueprint? the, the exam that's launching, the exam that's launching tomorrow has some changes on, in the BEC section. So I'm wondering if they're, they're looking to understand how BEC uh, content will be affected with this updated exam. Yeah, that, I mean, the new exams that are created that are launching tomorrow will uh, be according to the new blueprints. So more specific to the content, that would be a, a question for the CPAs to answer. Do we want any of our, uh, Kathy, Kevin, Liz, any one of you wanna come on, address that if you want to speak to, we also have a ton of resources about all the changes to all the sections. I'm sorry, what was the question I was, uh tunnel visioning on that Q&A. <laughs> no uh, so we're looking to understand um, a bit about the updates specific to BEC MCQs, you know, on the a new exam that's not new, updated exam that launches tomorrow. Um, the blue, you know, the blueprint that starts on July 1st, 2021, any of the new task statements that are at the remember and understand or application level could be eligible for testing in MCQs. Any that are at um, analysis and evaluation would only be at TBS and application can be MCQ or TBS. So if you're curious about what's gonna be new with BEC MCQs, I would direct you to the new blueprint and um, I would check out anything that's new at the remember and understand application task statement level. We have um, articles and videos and podcast episodes also that go section by section, you know, what changes you can expect on the updated exam. And I, I assume anybody who's tuned in today will be taking that exam since it launches tomorrow. Uh, so we'll be sharing all of that with you and I highly recommend taking a look at it so you know, you know what's changing and, and what to study for. Uh, thank you, Kevin. Um, okay, we've got a few other questions. Now I'm looking in the Q&A box. Um, Okay, on the pretest, uh, the candidate spends time completing a pretest but does not complete this section. Um, do, do they lose credit? I don't know what they're trying to ask there. So, maybe. so first of all, the pretest questions are mixed in. So it's not 
I know on, on some uh, standardized tests, the, the pretest questions are a separate section, but the here, they're just sprinkled throughout. Um, so you should spend, you know, budget your time so that you finish the whole, uh, the whole each test lit, um, you know, the whole exam and the amount of time you have available, uh, but you won't know which ones are pretest and which ones are operational. Okay, um, that looks to be it for the questions. I think our, our team is actually answering all of them right now. So just a quick note, uh, again, if you at some point are interested in contributing to the exam, Carrie is the gal you wanna reach out to on that. Um, you can feel free to email us. There will be an email address included in the thank you email you get. So you can email either myself, the CPA exam address or Carrie if you're interested at that point, in giving back to the profession. Uh, you'll get a recording of this tomorrow. Looks like we're wrapping up a little bit early. Carrie, Renee, is there anything that you guys want to add before we finish up? I just want to thank everyone for their interest in the process and what, what goes on behind the scenes. What she said. <laughs> <laughs> just thank you so much for attending. It's, uh, it's always a joy to share, you know, how, how the exam is created and hopefully we answered your questions. And uh, please feel free or please, we encourage you to fill out the survey that you'll be prompted to take after this webcast, because this webcast actually is a result of a lot of feedback that we got that people want to better understand the process of creating an MCQ. Um, and, you know, one of, like I mentioned earlier, one of the topics we're looking to do in the future is about simulations and written communications and how that, those come to be. So we're, we're always open to feedback, what you guys want to hear about. So I think that's it. Good luck so much with your journey, guys. Stay cool. It's super hot out. And uh, thank you, everybody. <laughs> Appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Take care.